in Genesis chapter 37, verses 23 to 30. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they strapped him of his stripped him of his robe, an ornate robe he was wearing, and they took him and threw him in to a cistern. The cistern was empty, and there was no water in it. As they sat down to eat their meal, they looked up and saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Their camels were loaded with spices, balm, and mirth, and they were on their way to take them down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, What will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood. His brothers agreed. So when the Midianite merchants came by, his brothers pulled Joseph out of the cistern and sold him for 30 shackles of silver to the Ishmaelites who had taken him to Egypt. You may be seated. Heavenly Father, we just praise you and thank you. Father, this is your service. These are your men. These are what you have uh, ordained for this time, Lord God, to be preached. Lord, I, I, I claim to know nothing about what you need today. Uh, I'm just a vessel, Lord. But Lord, I'm a vessel that has chosen in my free will, Lord God, to give up who I am that you may be glorified, that you may have free course. Lord, I know we're in the 11th hour of your return, Lord. I know that you are awesome in every single way. And I know that you could flow without the pews of this church, Holy Spirit of God, and work in every heart, including mine. And I pray, Lord, you'd have your way here. And I pray, Lord, that your name would go forth. And I pray that everyone would walk out of here differently than the way they walked in. And it's in your holy name I pray, Jesus. Amen. 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 I entitled this sermon, From the Pit to the Prison to the Palace. Joseph was a man who loved the Lord, was a follower of the Lord, and Joseph had a dream. And in Joseph's dream, he had dreamed that his brothers would be seeking him, which provoked them to anger. Can I tell you, gentlemen, be careful who you tell your dreams to. Not every person you will run across in this lifetime will want to know your dream. You have to be discreet on who it is that you share your visions with, who you share your future with, and who you share your most intimate thoughts with. There are many a person that you can't trust, and these were even his own brothers were turned on him. But Joseph also had a wonderful colorful coat that his dad gave him. And so there was favoritism going on in the family, which also provoked his brothers to hate him. And so when they were at a time when they thought ready, they took Joseph and they threw him in the pit, in the King James, and a cistern in the NIV. And they were going to leave him to die, hoping that some man would come by and just, just chew him up. But you see, this was their plan for Joseph's life. Little did they know that they were walking into exactly what God had wanted to have happen. They thought this was their plan. They thought they were getting rid of their brother. But what they were doing was following exactly the providence of God for Joseph's life. Amen. Amen. And so as they followed what they thought was right in their own eyes, they come back and they told their father Jacob that Joseph indeed was dead. And that he indeed was no longer around, but he had been mowered by an animal and the blood of a goat was put all over his garments to show that that was so. And Joseph was headed on to Egypt now, bought by the Israelites. He had no idea where he was going. He had no idea what was going to happen to his life. He had no idea what was in the future for himself. All he knows is that he loved God. 
All he knew was that he had a God that was going to sustain him some way. He had a God that was going to make provision with him some way. And he knew that even if he were to perish, even if things didn't work out, that he'd be in heaven with God. Amen? Amen. Even if all had failed, he had heaven to look forward to. But God wasn't done with him yet. And so as you turn to Genesis in 39... A couple of pages over, you'll find Genesis 39. And in Genesis 39, he was brought to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh took Joseph. And again, it was by the providence of God. He has Joseph there, and Joseph's working in his palace. He's cleaning and doing uh, housework. And Pharaoh's wife has noticed that Joseph looked really good and she wanted Joseph really bad and she had chased him around and wanted to sleep with him but Joseph loving the Lord as he did said I can't do this thing against my God I can't do this things against my Lord and so she ripped a part of his garment and he gets in trouble for it and in verse 19 in chapter 39, we read the following account. When his master heard the story, his wife told him, saying, This is how your slave treated me. He buried, he was burned with anger. Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. But while Joseph was in the prison, the Lord was with them. Can I say that one more time? The Lord was with him. He was never alone. He did nothing wrong. He was accused, falsely accused of something he didn't do. But as the Bible says, the Lord was in the pit with Joseph. The Bible is now telling us that the Lord was with them. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in prison. And he was made responsible for all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. You see, gentlemen, You could be falsely accused. You could be put in prison by a false account. But if you love the Lord, the Lord is going to be there with you. The Lord was not only in the pit with Joseph, but he was also in the prison with Joseph. Joseph never left the Lord. Joseph never cursed the Lord for his hardship and his poverty. He didn't curse God because he was enslaved, because he was sold as a slave for the slave traders. He never blamed God for his circumstances. He never blamed God for what his provision was. But he knew all along, no matter where he was going, no matter what his lot in life was, no matter how his circumstances were to play out in his life, that he was never going to be alone, that God was with him everywhere, amen? Amen. And so it was that God was with Joseph in the prison. And the Bible tells us that he had favor with the warden and that he was made in charge of the prisoners. Coincidence, you may think? I don't think so. Do you? No. No. The Lord looked over him even in his prison situation. I suppose there are some that would say, I'm not going to follow this God because I was thrown into a pit. I suppose there are some that would say, you know, preacher, if uh, God is with me and I'm put into a prison, uh, I'm not going to be following some God that's going to allow this to happen in my life. But wait a minute. God was with them. And God was not done with him yet. And so he is in the prison and he interprets two dreams. One for the butler and one for the chef. 
And the one for the butler, he interpreted the dream. And he said, it's not me to interpret dreams, but my God is able to interpret. And so the Lord interprets the dream for the butler that he would be able to get right back into circumstances with the Pharaoh from whatever he did that landed him in prison. And for the chef, he said, the dream that he had, he said, you'll die. And sure enough, but, but when they were released, Joseph said, remember me. Remember me when you're released. Remember me when you go back into Pharaoh's household that I interpreted these dreams and, and, and have favor with me. And here's Joseph in this prison for 14 years. 14 years. I can tell you my faith would be running a little thin if I was in a prison for 14 years and I knew that even though I knew God was with me, I'd be questioning God, what is the point of me being in a prison for 14 years? I'm just being real with you. But he was there in this prison and he interpreted both of the dreams. And both dreams had passed, passed along just as, as Joseph had said. There's a one day they come across and Pharaoh had a dream. And Pharaoh had a dream and no one was able to interpret it. There was no one that was able to figure it out. And so we'll turn to, we'll turn to chapter 41. Just one chapter over. It's starting in verse 37. And Joseph interprets the dream that there would be seven years of great harvest. Plentiful harvest where they would get all of the grain, all the substance that they would need for the fields. But Joseph also correctly says that after that seven years of great feast and harvest, that there was going to be a seven year drought. So Joseph's now been taken out of a pit. He's now been put in the palace. He's falsely accused of the palace. He's put into prison. He's taken out of the prison. He stands before Pharaoh, shaved him with new clothes, and he's telling the, the mightiest, greatest king on the face of the earth at that time that there's going to be a famine. And the king could have killed him for saying such a negative thing before him in his presence. But he takes to heart what Joseph said. And he says the following in verse 37 of chapter 41. The plan seemed good to Pharaoh and to all the officials. So Pharaoh asked them, can we find anyone like this man? One who is of the spirit of God. Can I read that again to you? In whom is the Spirit of God? Pharaoh, an atheist, uh, Pharaoh, an ungodly, wicked man, saw the Lord in Joseph, saw the fact that Joseph was able to interpret a dream that did not come from himself, did not come from the false idols of those days, and all of the foolishness that went on in that day. But Pharaoh rightly said that it came from the Spirit of God. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has made all of this known to you, there is no one so discerning and wise as you. You shall be in charge of my palace and all my people to submit to your orders. Only with respect to the throne will I be greater than you. Joseph went from the pit with God, sold into slavery, headed down to Egypt, worked at Pharaoh's house, falsely accused, put into prison for 14 years. In the prison of 14 years, the people that were supposed to remember him before Pharaoh forgot all about him. But God had another plan for Joseph, amen? God had another provision for Joseph. And so famine broke out just as Joseph had said it would. 
And as it was, they stored in barns, and they double stored in barns, and they made provision so that in the seven years of lean, they would have what they needed, but they rationed it out. And Pharaoh knew that Joseph had the plan. And Joseph had the plan, not because Joseph had the plan, but because God had given him the plan, amen? And so his brothers are thinking, Joseph is dead, they put him in a pit. They think that he is no longer alive, so the animal came to get him. They had no idea what the life's course for Joseph was. They had no idea that God's plan included some hardship into his life, but it also included some great reward. He was at the lowest point of his life, literally in a pit. And if that wasn't bad enough, he was put in a prison. But he never gave up on his God. He never gave up on his relationship. And as he never gave up on those things, he counted on God for his very lot in life, no matter what was going to be before him, no matter how ugly it may have looked, he knew that his God was still in charge. Amen? Amen. He knew that God was still there. And he knew that God hadn't given up on him. And you see, God never gives up on us. We give up on God. We say to God, God, we, you walked away from me. You didn't work there when I needed you. But when you study your own life and you study the account of your life and mine, you always find that you and I are the ones that left God. It wasn't the other way around. Amen. God never leaves nor forsakes. As long as you are there and you repent before a holy God, say, God, I screwed up. I did something I should have done. God will be there. God will be there. But God, you don't know what I've done here. God, you don't know what I've done over there. Listen, guys. God is omnipresent. God is omniscient. God knew the very things that you and I would do in our whole entire lifetime, even before the foundations began. Amen? Amen. He knew this day that you would be here. He knows tomorrow what you're going to do and every day till the rest of your life. There's nothing that's taken him by storm or surprise. But he's asking us and he's calling us to be in a relationship with him. And he says, just repent. Just ask for mercy and forgiveness. And I'll give it to you. There's nothing that's too hard for God, and there's nothing so great before a high and mighty God that he cannot forgive. And so Joseph is put second in charge. And so Joseph moves from the pit to the prison to the palace. And as Joseph is in the palace, he's running the whole show right underneath Pharaoh. And God was with him and God had a plan but God was not done with him yet and as it was the famine broke out and Joseph's family was hungry and they needed food and so some of Joseph's brothers came up into Egypt to gather food and they stood before their own brother they didn't even recognize it was Joseph They had no idea it was their own brother that they were looking at. And Joseph sends them away with a little bit, inquires to the family and the father and his little brother Jonathan that he loved. And there come a special moment when Joseph had all of the brothers come up. And so there was 12, a total of 12 for the 12 tribes of Israel. And he has them all come up for a meal as they come up for food. And as they sit around the dining table in Pharaoh's castle, he's got them all sitting next to each other according to their age. And they're all looking at each other like, how is it that we're all sitting next to each other according to age? Is that a coincidence? I think not. And so finally they have their meal 
And Joseph relays to them that he indeed is their brother. If you turn with me a couple more pages over to Genesis chapter 45. In chapter 45, just a couple pages over, verses 4 through 8. 4 through 8 in ch chapter 45. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now, do not be distressed, do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here, because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now, there had been famine in the land, and for the next five, there will be no plowing or reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So that it was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me father to Pharaoh, Lord of his entire household and ruler over all of Egypt. You see, his brothers thought they were doing something on their own, but God took what was evil and used it for good. It was God's provision that they threw him in the hole. It was God's provision that he was sold into slavery and taken by the Ishmaelites. It was God's providence that he was put into a prison for 14 years. And after that 14 years, it was God's providence that the famine was going to take place and that Joseph was going to be able to interpret the vision and the dream that Pharaoh had. Where do you think Pharaoh got that dream from? It was from God. And God used Joseph in a mighty and powerful way to be able to show that he is in charge of everything. You and I may think we're in charge of our lives. You and I may think that we're doing our own thing. But don't be fooled. God knows exactly everything that we're going to do between now and the time that we pass. There's nothing that's going to take God by surprise. His brothers realized at this point that the dream that Joseph gave them that got them so angry with him back in the day before they threw him in the pit when he had the vision and he had the dream that he was going to be in charge of their lives and they were going to be underneath them, they realized that that was come to fruition. They realized that that was come true. And there was no more anger with the boy, with his brothers against Joseph. In fact, they re repented of doing what they did. And there was remorse on their part for what they did to their brother. And so Jacob finally comes up and he stands before Pharaoh, and I preached on that not so long ago. But in Genesis chapter 50, I want to close with Genesis chapter 50. It's the conclusion of from the pit to the prison to the palace. Genesis chapter 50 in 19 and 20. Genesis chapter 50 only a few pages over and I'll give you a second to get there and I appreciate those of you who are diligently seeking the scriptures and looking for God's word but Joseph said to them don't be afraid I am I in the place of God can I say that again don't be afraid am I in the place of God yes he is he's exactly where God wanted him to be you indeed, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then, don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he assured them and spoke kindly to them. 
You see, all along the way, the brothers thought they were going to get rid of their brother. They thought that he was dead. All along the way, they thought he was done with. But God had his hand on Joseph because Joseph loved him. And instead of dying, instead of perishing out in the wilderness, and instead of be being beaten by the Ishmaelites, and instead of dying in the prison and staying there for an extended amount of time, God used Joseph through a horrible situation, through a horrible set of experiences. All of that he went through and the uncertainty and the uncertainty of where his life was headed for and the uncertainty of his life even to know what tomorrow will bring to him. But God said he used all of that all of that poverty, all of that hardship, God used it all to save lives of others. God said, I used it all because at the right and at the appointed time, he took Joseph, he put him second in command, he interpreted the dream, and Joseph was used mightily by God to save not only his own brothers and his own family, but those in Egypt and those in neighboring countries. God used him mightily because everybody went to Egypt to buy grain and to buy what they could. Because the, the famine was so bad, there was no plowing, there was no way they were going to grow anything. And, and you kind of look at last summer and the drought that we had last summer and how the water table went down so far. And, and you look how the food prices increased so drastically because there was a famine, there was a dust bowl. And food became more expensive. It was there, but it became more expensive. But this was sort of the same thing, only there was no other options. I mean, you just didn't go to a different store and, and you just didn't have stuff shipped in from another country. You were doomed. And God used Joseph in a mighty and powerful way. And God didn't care that Joseph was thrown in a pit. God didn't care that he was thrown into a prison. And God didn't care that society looked down upon him and wanted nothing to do with him because of where he was at and who he was. But God says, you're mine. You're mine. I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to forsake you. And although the circumstances of his life were such as they were, God was with him all the time. But wait a minute. God was not done with him yet. Because as our story closes, Joseph was reunited with his family. He was reunited with his dad. And as the story goes, they were able to get choice land from Pharaoh to grow and to be able to keep their, their animals healthy and to keep them in a great place to be able to grow everything that they wanted to grow and into a, a wonderful place in Egypt. So you say, preacher, what has this got to do with us here at the Bolaki Rescue Mission? What has it got to do with us? We're not Joseph. My point is this. God took a man who had absolutely nothing. A man that society had nothing to do with, wanted nothing to do with. His own family turned on him, with the exception of his dad. His own brothers couldn't stand him. He had absolutely nothing to offer. He had absolutely nothing that he could point to and say, well, I've got this in the bank. I've, I own this. I got that. And then use that to, as collateral or use it to get favor in society. No. Joseph had God. That was all Joseph had was God. But Joseph found like you were going to find, like I found, that God was sufficient. 
and God was all you need. You may not have absolutely nothing else going for you. And you may find yourself either in the pit or you might find yourself in a prison, imprisoned by your circumstances, not a, not a physical prison, but, by a, but a prison in your mind, a prison of circumstances, a, a spiritual prison of sort. You may find yourself there. But God's not done with you yet. You're just passing from one phase of your life to the next. When Joseph was in the pit, he was in a phase of his life, but God moved him to another phase of his life. And from that, he moved him to another phase of his life. And you're sitting today at the 445, and you find yourself either in the pit or you find yourself in the prison. But Jesus said, I can give you eternal life. And as I can give you eternal life, I can erase your sin. I can, re I can give you eternal life. And I can give you the palace. Amen. I can give you a place of eternal glory. I can give you a place that you will spend forever with the Lord, with God and the Holy Spirit. I'll give you a place that you can spend forever with the rest of your brothers and sisters whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. I can give you a place where everyone that knows Jesus is going to be the streets of gold, wonderful mansions, a place that the Lord God says, I came and described to you because the words you'd never get. The Lord has promised you a palace. But the palace comes when you repent and you say, God, I, I can't make it on my own. I can't get to this palace by myself. My circumstances don't make it so. But the Lord shows up at the 445 today and he says, I have made a provision by my son on the cross who died for the sins of mankind. I have made provision on the cross as the blood was shed. And the Lord Jesus said it was finished. It was his shed blood that was shed for all of mankind. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. But God had not spared his own son. And the Bible tells us that the Lord loved us so much that he sent his only begotten son that God had demonstrated his own love toward us, yet while we were sinners, Christ died for us on the cross. Amen. Amen. So you may be in a pit, you may be in the prison, but God is saying with me and through me, I can put you in the palace. Amen. No matter what goes on in this life, no matter how many years you got here, and maybe it's a hundred if you're lucky. No matter what it is, unless the Lord returns early, God has promised us that know Him, a, a mansion, and a place of eternal life, a sin debt that's been forgiven. Because, gentlemen, it's not because of us. It's not because of what we deserved, just as it wasn't what Joseph deserved. But God was with him. And as I close right now, I'm telling you that God is not through with you yet. Amen? Amen. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, we just thank you so much for this service. We thank you, Lord God. For the years that we spent in the pit. We thank you, Lord God, for the years that we spent in the prison. And we thank you, Lord, that those places won't hold us. Those places will not keep us. But if we are yours, there's a palace. There's a palace for each and every single one of us whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life and the Lord. Lord. Is there anyone here today that would want to raise a hand and say, today, I want to know this Christ that you were talking about. I may be in the pit, I may be in, in the prison, but I want to know Christ. Does anyone want to raise their hand? I know last night some people did. Amen. I see your hands. One, two, three, four. Say no words last night. Let me pray for you. Let me pray for the meal. And uh, let me uh, say you uh, off. Lord, we just come before you. We lift, pray for these four men who lifted hands for salvation. 
Father, they pray, I pray that they would just repeat a, a prayer, a simple prayer, but if it's from the depth of the heart, Lord, you said that they would, they would know you as Lord and Savior. Lord, I, I come before you. I have sinned. I know, Lord, that you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I repent for my life and I repent for doing things my way. I call on you as my Lord and as my Savior. I call upon you, Lord, to guide me. Come into my life. May the Holy Spirit administer to me and teach me the things of Christ. Write my name in the Lamb's book of life and keep me in the palm of your hand forever. I relinquish my life that I may have yours. And Lord, I pray for those today, Lord God, who are in the pit or the prison. Lord God, I pray they come to know you as Lord and Savior. I pray for families here, Lord, that they would be able to be reconciled. 